Thank you for your attention. You're very welcome uh, here this evening uh, to this debate, organised by the Green Party as always, um, to what we hope will be um, a really informative night. Right? The, uh, the objective here is for us to inform each other of opposing perhaps, but of, of each other's views. And uh, to try and swell with that information, hopefully improve all our understanding of this issue that's obviously of interest to you or you would not be here. Um, Eamon Ryan is my name in the Green Party and I'm chairman for the night. I was going to AFM early on this morning and I jokingly said what I don't do is give us Barabbas meetings where some poor person is, the, is kind of a sacrifice and someone else is, is hauled out uh, hands up on people's shoulders. So I, I'm going to try and chair this in a way that keeps it as as good a debate as possible, as respectful to, to different views, where we listen to each other, we give each other time, and give each other the respect that we should call all accord to each other. I'm very glad that we have a place for us to assist our conversation, and very much I think the audience is as much a part of this conversation tonight as the four people standing beside me here. But I think it's useful that we have four people who will be willing to kind of contribute by setting the scene and setting out uh, some details of the particular project that we're here to consider. Um, I, I will ask each of them, the three initially, um, to say set five, ten minutes, whatever, just a small presentation, just to set their sense of, of, of the nature of this project or the uh, issues related to this project. And then I'm going to throw it open to, the, to all of us here, um, through myself, to, to uh, present questions, to present some of your views, to keep it really tight and short so we all, I mean, there's a good crowd here, so we each get a chance, maybe as much as we can to set out uh, some of your thoughts. Are people happy with that? Yeah. Um, what I'd hope to do is, I, I have to get home to wife and children in further South County Dublin, so I'm very keen that we finish at half past nine. This is a good Presbyterian hall. We should never go beyond half past nine. We should all be home in bed uh, with our cocoa and um, at a good early hour. So I hope that we can live to that and I'll be looking to keep us stick to that timetable. Each of the speakers that the people I have here in front of me, I'd like to briefly introduce you, Donald McGuire from Gordish Gawara, Niall Green from uh, Chairman of Sound Watch, um, James Sheridan from the Green Party here in Galway, and Tim McCarthy, businessman who's worked in the past in this area, uh, among many other different uh, community and business uh, efforts that he's worked in. Uh, I will start by perhaps asking Donald to kind of set out, I think, uh, some of the uh, the nature of the project that BIM are engaged in, I might ask Niall and then Seamus to respond, and then we can throw it up into a proper conversation. Don. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I suppose, first of all, I'd like to uh, kick off by saying uh, I see the building on the wall there is the, the, an application for the world's largest salmon farm. While that's very dramatic and it does uh, fill the house and fill the seats and it's sounds great, what we're talking about is, is nothing like that uh, in reality. It would be a big farm by Irish standards, a departure by Irish standards, but there are far larger production units in Norway and in uh, other parts of the world than, than we're proposing here. Um, what BIM uh, is about is about uh, creating jobs in the coastal communities and about creating a flow of seafood to meet international demand. That's why we're engaged in this particular project. We're not in it for glory, we're not in it for money, we're not in it for any form of aggrandizement or profit either for ourselves or for the agency. This is to meet a national need. Uh, there is undoubtedly an enormous untapped demand for organic certified Irish farm salmon. Uh, the major problem that uh, Irish farmers have and Irish seafood processors have is that they can't get enough raw material to supply the market demand. So there is a tremendous opportunity. That opportunity is real. And it's there right now. The difficulty is it won't last forever. Uh, you know, what will happen is that farmers in Scotland or elsewhere will fill the void, they will eventually get themselves organic certified and they will produce the fish. So the question really boils down to, do we want to take advantage of this commercial opportunity or not? Because these fish will be farmed. They will be farmed either in Scotland or Norway, but they, they will absolutely be farmed and they will be supplied to the same markets. So it's a question really of uh, an opportunity, uh, a really strong commercially viable opportunity for Ireland and then whether we take that opportunity or not. Now, moving to the specific project, what we apply for is uh, a large-scale salmon farm in Galway Bay 
in the league of the Iron Islands, and I see quite a number of people who are familiar with from the islands who at this stage I'm sure are absolutely bored out of their minds listening to me, and have had many presentations over the last uh, year or so as we've uh, worked our way through this project. Um, I guess most of you have probably seen the EIS in the detail, so I won't bore you with the facts and figures of what's involved. Uh, but we've applied for a license to produce 15,000 tons of production per year. That's a lot of fish. Um, it's a slow afternoon in Norway. They produce uh, 1.2 million tons of salmon per year. The Irish industry at the moment is somewhere between 14 and 15,000 tons. So in Irish terms, this would be a step change. It would be a big increase in production, but it's still very small in comparison to our nearest neighbours. Scotland, for example, currently produce upwards of 165,000 tons of salmon per year. So their industry is much bigger. Now, I know there are a lot of concerns about this, and we absolutely respect those. And that's why we've gone to great lengths to travel out to the islands, to the communities, and to hear what people have said and have to say. We've attempted to reassure people not everybody is happy, not everybody accepts what we've said, and we thoroughly understand that. So that's one of the reasons why we're here tonight, to again try and put forward our side of the story, to explain the science and technology that we've applied to this, and to reassure you that BIM, as an agency with a 60-year history, would not engage in something if we had doubts that it would cause significant environmental damage. So I think Chairman, that's it. Thank you. Now, uh, if, uh, if you don't want to stand or you can speak from where I'll, um, I'm speaking where I am. Can, I, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. If I speak up, you'll hear me, yeah. Uh, well, first, very quickly, uh, just a word about Salmon Watch. We're or Salmon Watch Ireland, we're the successor, as it were, to the Stop Salmon Drift Nets campaign uh, of 2004 to 2007. And at the end of, the successful end of that in 2007, we, um, and we don't claim all the credit for it, we claim some of the credit, but not all of it. Uh, but um, at the end of that, we sat down, we had a look at the life cycle of the salmon and said, well, look, there are some fairly significant problems here that we could usefully address. And one of them uh, was the question of salmon farming, and that has been the major topic for us, not the only one, uh, uh, since then. And we have been pursuing um, a case with the European Commission that Ireland is in breach of the Habitats Directive in the way which it manages uh, salmon farming. Uh, we have not frankly succeeded in that. They have now, as they say, close the file, um, but they've closed the file with a, an undertaking to closely monitor what's happening in Ireland, and uh, we uh, are certainly uh, going to help them in that monitoring, as are a number of other NGOs. Um, we, um, well, in 2004, the um, the European Court of Justice um, um, uh, laid out a uh, judgment in the case of generally known as Wadmsey. And they made it very clear uh, that uh, the assessment of projects that could impinge on uh, special areas of conservation, plans and projects, had to be constructed in a way that used the best scientific knowledge available. And that is the standard by which uh, the BIM proposal, or one of the standards by which the BIM proposal uh, has to be judged. Um, the best scientific knowledge in the field is probably not what the BIM uh, proposal is based on. Now, the EIS is not the end of the road. If it is assessed as a result of the EIS, and BIM contend it's not necessary, but if it is assessed through a screening process, that it must go through a process of appropriate assessment. Uh, there's also rules coming out of the Sea in that. But the contention seems to be uh, that this process is so clean uh, and uh, so um, um, unlikely to be harmful to Salmonids or anything else uh, that it can pass uh, muster. And the first problem we're up against there, of course, is the minister uh, is the competent authority to decide on these matters. And the minister is not, as it were, an objective party in this because he is actually uh, one of the cheerleaders for this project. So he's a, he's a promoter of the project and he's going to have to make decisions as to whether licenses be issued and whether appropriate assessment is needed. Now it's not any insult to the minister, it's not intended to be any insult to the minister 
uh, to say that that would be stretching our credulity just a little bit too far. Um, there were about, I think, I've never come to in detail, but roughly speaking, looking at what came off my printer, there were about 650 pages uh, in the EIS document and its associated um, papers. A little analysis of that, of that amount of paper throws up the following. There are 65 pages devoted to burrows. There are 25 pages devoted to archaeology. And by a generous <coughs> estimate, there's no more than 20 pages devoted to wild salmon issues. So that gives you some idea of uh, the fact that either BIM don't want to address the issue or uh, they are uh, deliberately playing it down. But more substantively, uh, if you look at the two great issues uh, affecting uh, salmon conservation, and these are the ones that concern us, other people have equally valid, uh, equal concerns about other issues, but the things that concern us are two, sea lice and escaping. Now, according to the BIM document, there's apparently no problem with sea lice, because, to quote, modelling output indicates that there is little or no spatial overlap between the model distribution of sea lice larvae from the proposed farm sites and the migration routes of Atlantic salmon smolts. This is because of, as the document says, the primary exit route from Galway Bay for smolts leaving the rivers for the Atlantic are, are generally seen as being north of the Iron Islands. While the Marine Institute has data arising from the South Sea Project, which is a big marine research project into the, life, into the marine life cycle of the salmon, they have the results from trawling, uh, research trawling done by Irish vessels as part of the South Sea Project, which shows uh, that uh, smolts uh, can be found, were found in the trawls, right within the areas that will be the high sea lice areas of the uh, um, uh, of, the, um, of the project. Now, I don't know how many smokes, I, I beg your pardon, I don't know what the total population might be of the smokes passing through it as you gross it up. But this was data available to Marine Institute, available to BIM, and it doesn't appear in the EIS. The BIM argues, the BIM document argues that even, well, it doesn't argue, even if, but it also argues that anyway, there is no problem with sea lice. And it does that on the basis of two papers produced by Dr. Jackson and his colleagues from the Marine Institute uh, published in 2011. <coughs> now, I have a small library of document of, of articles. Some saying there are big problems, some saying there are moderate problems, some saying there are no problems with sea lice. But it is a very large library of scientists all of them at least as eminent or of equivalent caliber uh, to Dr. Jackson from Scotland, Norway, even as far away as New Zealand, Canada, the United States. And there is a problem. And it can't just be uh, talked away. Even the most recent papers that uh, Dr. Jackson has put his name to, or a uh, bigger pardon, has co authored, um, uh, um, are clear in the fact that there is. A problem. But these these papers are not even mentioned in the uh, in the EIS. No mention either of amoebic gill disease, which is rampant in the Irish farming <coughs> sector and which makes slice treatment for uh, for lice almost useless, or or for the fact uh, that lice are developing immunity to current known treatment. Nor is there any discussion about whether the current inadequate control protocol regime designed for farm with only 3,000 tons is going to be, and it's not adequate for farm with 3,000 tons, but there's no discussion as to whether it's going to be adequate for 15,000 tons. On the escape issue, and I'll conclude in a moment, on the escape issue, BIM concluded that the actual record with regard to escapements from Irish salmon farms is good, and that over a three-year study period which recorded and described 250 escape incidents across Europe. <coughs> Only one escape was recorded in Ireland over a three-year period. Now, I don't know what three-year period that was, but it contrasts sharply with data that I got by just putting in a general <coughs> request, which showed that in the period of December 2009 to October 2010, 
before the BIM EIS was being prepared, presumably, there were two major and one minor escape incidents reported uh, to uh, the Department of uh, the Marine. And, and those three incidents involved some 14,000, uh, sorry, 114,000 escapees. Admittedly, some of them small, but capable of doing damage. But why was this data not mentioned? Why wasn't there a thorough examination of the data on the Irish experience of escape? The BIM document also states that the large scale studies by the Marine Institute on the genetics of wild salmon stocks confirmed that they had little or no uh, genetic interaction between farmed and wild stock. This latter statement, if they saw it, must have come as a surprise to Dr. Philip McGinnity and his co author of the two papers which were published in 2003 and 2009, which, which actually came to the conclusion that there was serious potential for genetic effects from scapees. And I could go on, and I could go on, and uh, bore you to death. Um, 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 uh, but what it boils down to, in our view, is this. That the BIM EIS, and I, I make this point now with respect to Donald, but it has to be made is at best an incompetent document, and it, of course, is a dishonest representation of the proposal to establish a salmon super farm in Galway Bay. Secondly, it comes nowhere leaving the Wadensee standard of using the best scientific knowledge in the field, and cannot form the basis for a screening exercise as to whether an appropriate assessment of the project is required. And thirdly, there's no evidence in the BI document, it may be quite the contrary, that this organization is to be trusted with the management of the project, which is many times larger and more complex than anything for which the experience of essentially small-scale salmon farming operations has uh, equipped them. This is a reckless project, pursued on the basis that the end justifies the means. But even the end is a paltry and totally overstated employment potential with large foreseeable and many unforeseeable consequences for the environment, for salmon conservation, for tourism, and for Ireland's green image. It is no wonder that virtually every individual, organization, and community group, whether on the island, islands or on the mainland, that has studied this application has come out against it. last year and now this this year. But from somebody who's exported farm salmon over the past 20 years to my own business and been involved in various debates, I started looking at this area last year when the plans were announced, not just for this farm, but for five other farms. And I, my main area that I want to address is, at the moment in the media, the debate is, is and rightly so, is centered between the, the wild salmon and the salmon fishermen and BIM. But tonight I also want to address some broader issues that might concern us all as citizens of Galway. So the first area that I'd like to address is the environmental side. I don't care how much salmon they're producing in Norway, or for that matter, Scotland. Um, this salmon farm is going to be between three of the most important tourist areas in Ireland, the Burren, the Iron Islands, and Connemara. Now, regardless of if it's a good idea or not, economically, that's where it's going. And when I was studying this issue, I know I want to address here waste. Now, I know Tony would say that the waste isn't a problem because there's always been fishing going away. Hey, and sure, there hasn't been more than the six million salmon that's going to be there. Maybe there was, but those fish were not fed land based produce. They were not fed soya. They were not fed wheat. They were not fed uh, certain chemicals and antibiotics. So, from a scientific point of view, I don't know if the effects of that's going to be good or bad. It might be great for a prawn business, or it might be a disaster. But to say we know for a fact that it's not going to be any effect, I don't like the certainty of which that's said. It will have an effect. What it is, we're not quite sure. Um, but don't say there's not the biggest salmon farm in the world. If there is a salmon farm that size, I would like it was included in the EIS so we could compare it to the effects, because there's no mention of comparison between another 15,000 ton farm, and I think that would be very valuable if you could have looked at that. But, um, 
So that's, that's the, just the waste part and the chemical alteration of go away. On the more environmental side, farm salmon is a carnivorous fish. And it's a great debate about this, but in very conserved, it takes two and a half to three kilos of wet fish to produce a kilo of wet farm salmon. Because farm salmon need to eat fish oil, which takes maybe seven kilos of fish, and they also have to eat fish meal. Um, so overall, uh, looking globally, it's great debate is whether can we keep sustaining the amount of farm fish we're producing if they're carnivorous and we're feeding them wild fish. And the sad, I know it's changing a little bit, but right up to this year, the industry name for wild fish unsuitable for human consumption, they call it trash fish. And I think that's just an example of how we're you know, kind of not taking into consideration the environmental consequences. So there's a very big picture to address on whether this type of farming should go ahead. Economically and business-wise, there's another flaw which may or not, I think is quite big, and looking at all the news coming out of Canada this week and out of Scotland. This is an open net farm. So the salmon in there, because they're put tightly together, and I know I've studied a lot in, in the world of poetry and industrial farming, they're very susceptible to disease. There is a salmon virus now that's rampant in Canada, and not only that, it's been a 100% uh, destruction rate. There is a debate now as to what we're going to do with all the salmon with the virus. The Food Safety Authority over there aren't going to know, they're worried about selling it on for human consumption. The government are, have to compensate the farms for the destruction of the salmon because it's not a, an official uh, food safety issue. So if we get uh, um, a new virus disease in, in Galway, which you probably will, who's going to pay for the destruction of all these salmon? And secondly, what are we going to do with six million salmon? We don't even have an incinerator that could cope. Or a fleet of trucks. The days and days of truckloads of salmon don't have to go back up to somewhere and leave. It's a huge decision that we have to take. We also have a maybe gill disease in Scotland, and the only way really you can treat that is by keeping the salmon in fresh water for a couple of hours. So how are we going to do that? Now, that said, I can see the reason behind this idea. Let's do five big farms. It would have been a good idea, I think, if we said, let's do five big farms and close in all the small farms. You know, that might have been sense. But let's have five big farms and keep all the small farms. I don't like that idea as well. And just to make things more complicated, this week in Scotland, there was a 60 million pound private investment into onshore salmon farming on land, in secure pens, funded by Marks and Spencers, being organised in consultation with Heston Blumenthal, the movie for the television, with contracts already out. Not only that, they're using, and we have fantastic advancements here in NUIG on the technology of using algae as a, as a form of protein and food. They're combining algae and ragworm and a small amount of fish trimmings to feed the salmon. And they're going to have a 3,000 ton capacity and they've got planning permission for it, and they're going to create jobs. So, with all respect to everybody, should not, should not we be looking at a system that, if we're going to take out wild fish and farm salmon and develop agriculture, which is a very good thing to do, we can. By the way, salmon is an excellent converter of protein because it flows in water. It's a much more economical and sustainable way of creating protein for our human consumption as opposed to poultry or pigs. So, agriculture is good, it is positive. But how are we going to do it? And if we're going to take up so much wild fish from Peru or from Chile or wherever we're getting it because the organic standard, oh, by the way, the organic standard we talk about later, I think is a total myth and that's going to be debunked in the next two or three years. And this is for me who's been going with me for years, by the way. I just think if we're taking so much fish out, why don't Ireland start leading Europe? If we're going to do fish farming, do it on shore and start protecting areas like Galway Bay and other bays in Ireland and protect our spawning grounds and go to the rest of Europe. Look at us. We are going to build a future for our fishing communities. We're going to create jobs. We're going to create tourism. And we're way ahead of the rest of you. And that's why I'm going to see you.
at numbers of levels, including the Council for the West, just down from Community Forum meeting here, and also knowing very well the location in question, which is the Iron Islands. But what I'm hearing, and I might just distill down a little bit into what's just been said in the three paragraphs, I wasn't asked here to give an opinion one way or the other, but just perhaps to help people understand a little better. There is a market opportunity because there is demand for organic certified farm salmon worldwide. So there is an opportunity for somebody to avail of that. Okay. There are a number of questions that arise when develop a large scale production unit for livestock, which is what's planned for the Ireland. It's a large scale production unit for livestock. In terms of what Stormy DIM has said, it's quite big scale, but yeah, there are farms that are at least as big elsewhere in the world. Not in this country, but there are elsewhere. I've been there, I've seen uh, there are numbers of that scale in Norway. And I was literally standing here, the farm is there. Okay, in fjords around Norway, you have farms at that scale. It's a different type of population. You're actually walking out of the cages, you're driving trucks out to harvest your fish, and you'll fish your own stuff like that. But farms of that scale do exist. They don't exist here. In terms of the whole debate around sea lengths and issues regarding wild salmon, I was very involved in that whole debate for a number of years. Once upon a time, I used to try the Irish Salmon Growth Association, when the whole debate around sea lice, the effects on wild fish of sea lice, whether it was or whether it wasn't, was at well, was its height. So that's a topic that needs to be thrashed out a little more, perhaps. And the waste issue in terms of the size of the farm and where the waste ends up going. I met the business actually to speak with, up to very recently, the head of the biggest fish feed supplier, probably in Europe, if not around the world. He ran the UK and Irish operations. And I spoke to him actually earlier on today. He's in Galway, as it happens at the moment. Just to ask him about the digestibility. In other words, how much of the food that you feed to fish how much of that food is actually ingested? How much of it is digestible? And again, this is just information for you guys. Uh, something like 10%, 7 to 9% of the actual constituents in the feed is made up of ash, what's called ash. That's like fish bone and that kind of stuff. The rest of it is fully digestible. All right? In terms of transforming fish food into fish flesh, conversion ratios to vary between about 0.85 to 1 and about 1 point, 1 1.15 and 1.2. So you're converting approximately 1 kilo of fish feed into fish flesh. So what the fish feed manufacturer was saying to me, and I just rang him just to ask him, just to have a little bit of information, is that the digestibility of the feed that's used is very high. There's a small amount of it that actually isn't digested, which is ash, which will go out of waste. All right? But the most of that stuff will actually be converted into fish flesh. It's a complex issue. We're talking about an area very high nice scenic community, the Iron Islands, and all over the world as a tourist destination. We're talking about putting what would be in Irish terms a large scale fish farm out there. But we're not talking about something that hasn't been done elsewhere. There is a market for the produce, beyond doubt. That may change if lots of other people get in and start producing more organic certified fish. The price currently being achieved for organic <coughs> fish around the world is very, very high. So if it achieves, or once it's out to achieve and produces organic fish, you can have a very profitable <coughs> business out there. A lot of potential, but we need to be done right. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. I'm here to answer questions, by the way. I'm here as an independent source. If anyone wants to